Today's an exciting day. We are finally going to start disassembling the aircraft. The goal of disassembling the interior is to confirm that the aircraft is wired and rigged the way that I expect it to be. I don't advise anybody to follow our steps and do what we're about to do. We have worked on modifying the ultralight for the past three to four years. We have constantly been communicating with Transport Canada on our progress and how we're doing the modification. This has built some level of trust where we now have an understanding of how to proceed with this aircraft. Before we start, I wanna make sure the aircraft is safe. So we're gonna disconnect the battery so that I can ensure none of the wires behind the instrument panel are alive when I'm working in that panel. Taking off the cowling of a 150 is pretty easy. We have two pieces, we have top piece, bottom piece, and around the perimeter of both pieces are quarter turn fasteners that you undo. So all it takes is quarter of a turn, and you hear it pop, and that's loose. And you keep going around. Whenever you're disconnecting a battery, I always recommend you start with the negative terminal. If I were to start with the positive lead first, that means the whole aircraft is grounded and bonded to the battery. And therefore, if I happen to be unscrewing the positive terminal and I touch the side of the airframe, we're gonna create a short and a spark. So always start with the negative lead. When you connect a battery, you should be doing it in the opposite order where you first connect the positive terminal and then you connect the negative terminal. What we're looking at here is a Continental O200A. It is a four cylinder, 100 horsepower carbureted engine and it came standard on the Cessna 150s. A lot of people get the 150 and the 152 confused, thinking that it's the same aircraft, but there are subtle differences between the two. The big one being the engine. On the 152, they upgraded to the Lycoming O235 that has 10 extra horsepower. The other subtle differences between the 150s and the 152s, the 150 has 40 degrees flap, where the 152 has 30 degrees flap. The 152s also have a longer vertical fin, uh, and this is to improve lateral stability. Because I couldn't figure out how to make a smooth transition in the storyline, we're just gonna jump right into the teardown. The primary instrument cluster is isolated from vibration using rubber shock mounts on each corner of the instrument panel. I started taking off the small nuts by hand, but quickly got tired of that and grabbed the drill. Oh yeah, so much better. And here's a little bicep flex for the views. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to take the instrument cluster off in one piece and that's because some instruments are connected to the pedostatic system and others are connected to the vacuum system behind the panel. I decided to unscrew the individual gauges and remove the panel separately. That gave me better access to the hoses. At this stage, most of the equipment is removed and things are starting to look good. With an old plane, I expected there to be many wires behind the panel, and this is exactly what we have. Now, over the decades, people keep adding more instruments and then they just end up zip tying all the bundles together and keeping the old wires. Here I'm explaining that the vacuum tubes are coming out of the top left corner of the firewall. That vacuum system has a filter, and what I notice is that most of the tubes go to the primary instrument panel, but there was one that went to the vacuum gauge to the right of the aircraft. And here we have the cable for the tachometer. Inside of the cable housing is a metal core that rotates in unison with the engine RPM. Once connected to the tachometer, it's able to display RPM. Removing the radio stack was a bit of a pain in the butt. There was a vinyl cover to cover the gap in the panel, and instead of using screws like a normal person would, they decided to use caulking. At least they used screws on the radio. And this is what the fuse and switch panel looks like for the Cessna 150. Looking at the wires behind the ignition key, we have two for the magnetos, one for left, one for right, one starter wire, and then one ground wire. If you were to switch the ignition key to the off position when the engine is running, what it does is it closes the circuit between the ground and the left and right mag. By grounding the magneto, it no longer creates a spark and the engine shuts down. Although that may seem counterintuitive, it's actually a pretty smart safety feature. In this configuration, your engine would continue to run if your magneto wires were ever cut 
or the connection were to degrade. Now I want to show you guys how some of the yoke and the linkages in the back work. Both yokes are tied to this V structure in the back. You can see it moving back and forward. When you turn your aileron, there is a chain that moves and is also connected to the other yoke. Let me see if I can get it. There you go. That. is all connected down here. When I go left and right, you could see there's two cables moving up and down in the center. When I go forward and back, the whole bar moves and is connected to cables underneath the floor. More modern Cessnas have the flaps that have notches. In our case, on the 150, it's a switch where if you press down, it's flaps down. When you go up, it's flaps up. So all it does is reverse the current on, uh, on the motor inside the wing. That's it, it's very simple. So that's it for the instrument panel. I'm pretty happy with where it's at right now. I'm able to have a look at everything and be able to design some of the brackets that I want and do a partial fit check for some of the components as well. So in here, we're doing a full dyno-on panel. We have an external monitor that we're installing for some of the autopilot system, but uh, that will be on a RAM mount. And then we also want to reproduce a small radio cluster to the right where we can install a radio, potentially a, an IFR device in the future. And then on the far left, we're going to have a Garmin G5 as a backup. That's it. It will be a pretty cool cluster.